your Bibles this morning, turn to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Pardon me while I try to clear my throat. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5. We're going to read verse 9 to verse 14. The title of the message this morning is, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. And we've talked a lot about these verses, and especially uh, another verse from Revelation 4.11, which we'll get to. And um, we've talked about the, uh, why we exist and uh, why we were created. And the Bible says we were created for His pleasure. That doesn't talk about Him being worthy. Uh, well, we haven't discussed that, so uh, we're going to talk about that this morning, about worthy is the Lamb. Revelation 5, verse 9 to 14, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto God, uh, unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand. That's a hundred million. And thousands of thousands, that's millions saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and, and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. It's a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now, Lord, that we, I pray that you help me, Lord, to get over how worthy Jesus Christ is of all the praise and honor and glory that we could possibly give him in a lifetime. Lord, he's worthy of more in a world that doesn't think he's worthy. And I just pray that, uh, Lord, you just bless those that are here. Thank you for all those that attending this morning. Lord, all the prayer requests that went out. For folks that just have needs and hurting, uh, they need something, and many of them need Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless now the message. May it bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, this passage of Scripture, um, I don't know how many times I've read it because I love Revelation, so I've probably read it hundreds of times. And I would, uh, I read it, and then I really didn't, it didn't really... It didn't really uh, say that much to me until after, uh, after I'd met with some Calvinists and um, one in particular tried to convert me. And I realized, I, asked, I always ask the Lord, you know, I, when I come up against things like that, I say, Lord, I need a verse. And this is one of the uh, verses that God gave me along with Revelation 4.11 because it says, Thou art worthy. See, Calvin's God has nothing to do with being worthy. Calvin's God just does what he wants to do, and he's not only allowed sin, he, he actually created sin. And that type of God is, I mean, he's just doing what he wants to do and accountable to no one. But here, and it's not God saying he's worthy, it's the creature that God created that's saying he's worthy. That's how I know you and I have a free will, that, we're, uh, that we, make, we make choices of what we do, of who we believe on. And you have to make a choice whether you think he's worthy or not. I'm going to give you some reasons why I think he's worthy. Um, but he says, he says that in the end, you know, Revelation's talking about the end. In the end, there's a whole bunch of creatures in the multitude and millions that are saying, Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. You know, we live in a world that they don't think he's too worthy of much. They don't think he's worthy of their time. They don't think he's worthy of their praise. They don't think he's worthy of their worship. They don't think that he's worthy of uh, a few dollars out of their pocket. They don't think he's worthy of too much, actually. They don't think too much of him. But my Bible says he's worthy. He, you know, he says that, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said this, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. That doesn't mean, mean he's worthy of it. He said, I have all power. Being worthy of it, well, that's somebody else has to decide that. 
You and I have to decide that, whether he's worthy of all power. You see, God has to prove himself too. He has to prove himself to a, to a, a sin-cursed uh, earth that is full of sinners. He has to prove himself to them that he's worthy. Uh, in Exodus 34, 14, he says, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, capital J, keep that in mind, is a jealous God. He said, I, I deserve all worship, but that doesn't mean he's worthy of it. You and I are the ones who decide whether he's worthy of it. It's the creature, it's the creation that decides whether he's worthy of all power and all worship. Then he said over there in Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Now we know that he shares his glory with us, his children, but he's talking about idols there and false gods. He says, I'm not sharing them. He says, I am God, there's none else. I know not any over there in Isaiah. As far as I know, I'm the only one out here. I'm God. But you know, that doesn't mean he's worthy of all glory. You and I determine that, whether He's worthy of all glory or not. In Revelation 4.11, He says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. But you know, God had to, He had to, he had to earn all that of being worthy. Because worthy, worthy denotes that you've done something that makes you acceptable that makes you presentable, receivable. <laughs> That's worthy. And the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of all those things. All the glory, all the honor, all the praise, all the power. He's worthy of it because, number one, because of His sacrifice. I mean, I don't know of any other God that's coming, that came down here in flesh and that died for man. Do you? I know a lot of them that like to tell you what to do, but none of them came down and sacrificed himself. I mean, this speaks a lot about the Lord. Hey, he created this, it, it, it got into a mess, and he got it out. And there are a lot of reasons I could go into of why he allowed it. We won't talk about that this morning, but the fact that he did, he got you out of the mess if you'll just accept it. Because why? Because of His sacrifice. Luke 24, 7 is saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. It's not like it just He was just some victim. He wasn't a victim. He said, For this hour came I into the world. He came for that purpose. He knew He was going to have to sacrifice Himself. And that's why he's worthy. I don't see anybody else stepping up. Or that had stepped up. Or that even could step up. He faced Calvary alone, with only the Father with him. He said in John 16, 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, and ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Man, in the garden, buddy, I mean, after, after a little bit of uh, swordsmanship from Peter, after that was over with, he told them to put up their sword in their place. I mean, all of a sudden, they just started to flee. And it looked like they were chasing after some of them because one of them got their garment grabbed and they left it behind. And he fled naked. I mean, what a set of circumstances. But there's Jesus. Where, where, where's the leaven? Well, the twelfth one was the one that, that uh, betrayed him. Where's the eleven? <laughs> now, some did fall behind, and, and one in particular actually went into the judgment hall with him. But for the most part, they left him alone. There's, listen, there's nothing they could have done to be a help to him. But he, he faced Calvary alone. He became a perfect Savior through suffering, the Bible says. He earned it. In Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it became him... For whom are all things, and by whom are all things. The Bible says He created all things. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God was not a perfect Savior. 
before he put his son Jesus Christ on this earth because he became a perfect savior, a perfect captain of our salvation through the sufferings that he endured. He's worthy. He's worthy because of his sacrifice. Uh, he's worthy because of his demonstration of love. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's the picture. God is commending his love, and here's what he's showing you. He's showing you a cross with his son on it. And while we were yet enemies of God, he came to die for us. Why, we're the ones that put him on the cross. How could you say he's not worthy? You got somebody else in mind that did that? Let's hear about them. I mean that knew from the time they were born why they came into the world. He says, for this cause. What? That cross. He's worthy because of his faithfulness. He said in Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. What a promise. You know, you, you can have people... People can promise you that in this life, but people cannot necessarily live up to it. They don't know. God can and will. He can promise you that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Every Christian has that promise. God couldn't possibly leave you. The Bible says you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost. But you have that promise He'll never leave you nor forsake you. A lot of things could happen to you, but God's still going to be right there. Whether you know it or not, believe it or not, He is. You ought to believe it because He says so. I don't care whether you feel anything or not. He said, he, he said He'd never leave you. said He'd never forsake you. So take Him up on it. And whatever you're going through, just realize that the Lord's right there with us. Going through it. In me. Not, ooh, hovering out here. He's in me. Oh, He's out here too, but He's in me. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God, who is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. I mean, that's being faithful. You know, the thing about, you know, unsaved people, they got, they got no protection. They even have time and chance to worry about. Me? Whatever's happening to me, God's got His hand on the dial. He can turn the heat up. He can turn the heat down. He can stop it. He can start it. He can pause it. <laughs> he can make it go long. <laughs> I mean, whatever's happening to me, God is in complete control of that thing. Why? Because He doesn't want to ruin me. He wants to perfect me. God's not out to ruin you. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what's happened to you, but God's not out to ruin you. God's out to make you a better Christian if you are one. And the only way he can do that, listen, nobody gets better from good times. I'm sorry, it's sadness and sorrow and pain and suffering. Those are the things that make us better people. It makes us, it makes us feel for others that we wouldn't normally feel. And you know, as you get older, God puts you through a few more things here and there just so you can know what it's like and have a little compassion. But he's worthy. Why? Because he's faithful. God is faithful to me. I'm not always faithful to him. But he is always faithful to me. Never leave me, never forsake me, never tempt me above that which I'm able. He's worthy also because of his promise. John 10, 28 says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Uh, us Christians in this age realize that we're not just in his hand, we're part of his hand. <laughs> That's a whole different message there. But we have his promise that, did he give you eternal life? He gave it to me. I mean, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I remember the day I got it. Guess what? I still have it. God's not going to take it back. I've got it. He gave me eternal life. In 1 John 2.25, it says this, and this is the promise that he had promised us even eternal life. It's a promise. 
The only thing that God cannot do is lie. So I have this, this promise. I have it. You say, what? I have eternal life right now, right now, right now. I know that seems difficult to believe, but it's true. I don't just have the promise of it. I have it, and I have the promise of it. He's worthy. I don't know if anybody else has promised you that. He's also worthy because of His blessings. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. There's just a myriad of things that go on. I mean, the, the blessings that we receive from day to day and week to week and month to month, if we wrote them all down, we'd have books full of blessings. And sometimes even the negative things are blessings. I may have had some negative things that were some of the, uh, you know, the turning points in my life, and I thank God for that. Uh, I've found out that many of the negatives are now positives. <laughs> like, some things I wouldn't have thanked God for a while ago, I'm thanking Him for now. You've got to be careful about those things. Uh, sometimes, you know, the Bible says that, and this is a promise too, <laughs> and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. Man, that's a... That's something, man, for God to be able to say something like that and live up to it, that all things work together for good. Yet everything in your life is working toward good. Your whole life is working toward heaven, so all things do work together for good. <laughs> you have eternal life, all things do work together for good. Even when you're misbehaving, it still has to work together. All things work together for good to them that love God. I mean, even when He's beating on you, it's working together for good. When you're getting a spanking... So because of his blessings, Proverbs 28, 20 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. I mean, you be faithful to God, you're going to abound with blessings. You're going to recognize them, you're going you're to praise God for them, they're going to be in your life all the time. Because why? God wants to bless a faithful man. But he's worthy. He's worthy not only because of his uh, faithfulness and his promise and his blessings, but because of his benefits. Just the benefits package is incredible. It's like nothing you've ever seen. Uh, not only after you get saved, I mean, you know, he could have just gave me eternal life and then, you know, I could have died in squalor. But he didn't leave me in squalor. Uh, he, could have, he, could have, he could have left me and not, not used me or did anything with me. But he said that he would give me, uh, he says, I'll give you life and I'll give it to you more abundantly. He promised me an abundant life if I would just yield to it. You know what I found out? That's exactly true. I mean, you'll live more than 10 people out there if you just love the Lord and, and search Him out and be faithful to Him. He'll show you an abundant life. Not only besides that, there's joy. I mean, I'm, you know, I can't say I've come in here with a smile on my face every time, but nearly every time. <laughs> Why? Because I've had great joy. Very happy. Blessings. We mentioned those. All kinds of blessings. Purpose. We've got a world out there that have absolutely no purpose. If they were to just think about their life and examine it, they realize they have, because none of it's eternal. I have eternal purpose in everything that I do. I am here as a testimony and a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I have eternal purpose. You know, sometimes the reason you want to live is because you have purpose. And I think a lot of, you know, the, the suicides are up again. I mean, they're up. And you know, they're not up just against the young. They're up against the very old. And the reason they're up is the young, the youngins, the teenagers are finding out they don't have anything to live for or they're finding, and the old people already knew that and wonder why they're hanging around. Why, if you don't know God, you don't have any eternal purpose. That's why we go into rest homes. That's why we're there. Not only that, He's worthy. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, He became worthy of every soul we could possibly get for Him. Whether we got to go all around the world to get them. He's worthy of them. Listen, He's worthy of their worship. He is worthy of their praise. Why? Because of all the things that He did. 
I mean, if God had done nothing, okay, let's trash him. But how are you going to trash a man that's willing to come down here and die in your place? Hang naked on a cross and pay for your sins. I think that somebody's trying to get you out of trouble. I said it before, God's responsible for all this. He is. He's responsible for sin coming in the world. But when He steps up to you and says, listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take the blame for everything you've ever done wrong. Everything. Does that redeem me in your eyes? Does that make me worthy of you now? Whew. Not only that, because of his preparations. If, if, if just if you had eternal life, to live eternally. But then there's the preparations. In John 14, 2 and 3, he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, he's not lying to you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. The Lord's up there preparing an eternal place for you. I mean, listen, this God stepped up and did abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. When this thing is over, when this new world, new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem come about, it's going to blow your mind. Because God's plan is now working perfectly. We've got through the bumps. We've got through the troubles. But he's already proved himself worthy. Before you ever step into New Jerusalem, before you ever walk the street of gold, before any of that ever happens, before he puts a crown on your head for serving him, he's still worthy because of what he did. And also because of his preparations. Revelation 21, 2 says, I, saw, I John, saw... The holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared <laughs> as a bride adorned for her husband. Preparations. God has planned an existence for you that is out of this world, literally. It's like nothing. I, I, I tell people, I say, you know, the, 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 very, the very thing you think about, that you would think an all-powerful, omniscient God would do for you, there it is. You can't, you, can't, you can't get better than this. I mean, where you have eternal life and eternal body, and there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. I mean, come on. And that's the things that are prepared for us. They're up ahead. I'm telling you the things he's done in the past make him worthy. Because of his preparations. He's worthy of you. Why? No greater sacrifice offered. No greater love given, no greater faithfulness demonstrated, no greater promise declared, no greater blessings bestowed, and no greater benefits presented, and no greater preparations for the future. I dare you to find me another God. Any God. Not only a book that can prophesy the beginning from the end, but has all that. Find them for me. You can't. It's only in this book right here. All of that. He's worthy. You see, really, this message is, not, is really not about whether He is worthy of you. It's whether you're worthy of Him. Matthew chapter 10, this is the last two verses I'm going to read. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 and 38. This is, this is a tough passage of Scripture. You're not going to like it. <laughs> it's a tough passage. It says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That's a very, very tough passage of Scripture. But it's not like he's not worthy of it. You know, when you think about it, I mean, we love our wives. We, we love our sons. We love our daughters. We love our mates. We love friends. 
And then there's the creator who provided the spouse, the friends, the grandchildren, who provided all the things that we have in this world that we do enjoy. And man just kind of just pushes him right out of the way. When he's worthy. The, the, really, the only, the only individual you should be getting to know more than anybody else is him. So that you can say, oh, I love him more than my wife. Oh, I, oh, I love him more than my, my husband. I love him more than my children, my grandchildren, my friends. He's the love of my life. Then you're finally worthy of him. Till then you're not. That's what he says. He says you're not worthy of it. The lost question whether he is whether he is worthy. The saved should question whether they are worthy. Because he's worthy. <laughs> he's worthy of anything you could ever do for him. And think about it a second. The creator. He's first. And if you spend your time knowing Him, fellowshipping with Him, praying to Him, it's not, now listen, I'm not saying you're not, not loving somebody else or loving anybody less. Oh no. Oh no. It's that you're loving Him so much more. That's why the other, the other verse that goes along with this says, he that, it says, He that doesn't hate father or mother. It uses the word hate. And the first time I read it, it just kind of set me back. But then I read this passage, it says, He that loveth. And I said, what's going on? He's talking about the difference. I've used the example before. Paul and I talked about this. We've used this example in the prison. But if you have, oh, and if you're a pet lover and you tell me something different, I'll shoot you. <laughs> but if you, have, if you have a dog and you have a child, both run into the road and one of them's going to get hit with a semi, I mean, there should be absolutely no decision in your mind and heart of who you're going after, right? Almost the difference between love and hate. That's the same way it should be with God. There should be such a love for God that the difference is like love and hate with everybody else. It's not that you hate anybody. It's not that you don't love your wife and, you know, and dote on your wife if you want to, and dote on your husband and on your grandchildren. Sure! But he should be the love of your life. I finally understood the first and great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And I think, how in the world, God, can you command people to love you? But those commands are there to protect you. Just like they protect you from a thief or from a murderer. When it says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, it protects your heart. Because if you lose everything, you still haven't lost the love of your life. They can't kill God. So you don't go crazy. You don't lose your mind and wind up in an institution. Why? Because you have loved the one you should have loved all along. The one that's given you everything that you love. He's worthy. It's been day after day telling myself I'm going to love him more. I want to love him more. I want to know him better. The more I find out about him, the more I love about him. I, some people, they, they go to this book and it, they're horrified and they go running the other way. Not me, man. I'm like, yes, sir. Lord, that's right. That's right. You're perfect. Everything I find. Because God will show you the truth about things. He'll show you why they are. All I know is God got a bad rap. And what he did, he's not worthy of. What, what, what they're doing to him, what they're saying about him, how he's being maligned, he's not worthy of that. But he is worthy of our love. All right, let's all stand. Let's we'll take a few minutes to pray. If you need to come and pray, the, the altar's open. We don't have a piano player this morning. She's tending to a new baby.